Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science at George Washington University. Welcome back to the POMEPS Conversations, our series of chats with leading scholars in the field. With me today is Sheila Carapicho of the University of Richmond and author of the new book, Political Aid and Arab Activism, Democracy Promotion, Justice and Representation. Um, uh, Sheila is also uh, one of the country's leading experts on Yemen, and uh, I wanted to begin the conversation by talking about Yemen. Sure. So. Since the, uh, the conclusion of the National Dialogue uh, a little while back, uh, attention to Yemen seems to have largely dropped off. And uh, what is your sense of, of the conclusion of the dialogue, uh, what it has and hasn't accomplished, and what we might expect uh, from Yemeni politics at this point? Well, the conclusion of the dialogue was curious because it was um, something that really wasn't part of the uh, original mission for the dialogue. The main conclusion that's been reported and discussed was to create a kind of federal system, which involves, you know, basically redrawing the entire map of the country and its administrative units. So it's a huge task. And I'm not sure it's that well advised, I mean, because it's really a brand new kind of political construction. It could be very open ended and take a very long time. And it, uh, so you would, it would get rid of the existing provincial or governor at, uh, authorities and congeal it into um, fewer, larger units. And, but that also invites then, I think, a lot of kind of local and regional struggles over where are those units going to be, who's right. going to be in charge of them, how will they be constructed. And the idea was intended to, but has not really resolved the two regional conflicts, which are in the southern part, of course, and then the El Houthi rebellion in the north. So there's a lot of ambiguity. Do you think that the way the dialogue was designed uh, was conducive to actually resolving these disagreements, or were there structural problems with the way it was constructed? My view is that um, the dialogue was really said, I mean, it was a, an indigenous model, and very much there's a Yemeni tradition of it, but it was also, uh, is frequently referred to as the Gulf Cooperation Council Initiative. And the Gulf Initiative, or the Gulf states, you know, they don't have an interest in democratization. They're not interested in um, what were the interests of the youth uh, rebellion in 2011. So it was intended and may have been successful to the extent that it was, you know, intended in part to um, f forestall the potential outbreak of a civil war. Mm -hmm. um, now people are, start, are worrying about the outbreak, not so much of a civil war as a number of different mm -hmm. uh, conflicts. and. Uh, at the same time, I think its political goals were almost deliberately ambiguous. Has, has there been any sign that the dialogue successfully brought these different groups into, the, into a process that had bound them to this new state? Or did it just sort of end and all these forces went their own separate ways? You know, there's a significant group among the Southerners who uh, didn't want to participate in the dialogue. And to some extent, that's also true of the Houthis. So there were a lot of, of groups that were fairly enthusiastic about the dialogue, but it didn't necessarily, almost by definition, it didn't include those who would rather fight than negotiate. Right. I've heard from a lot of the youth activists that they felt completely shut out from the process, that they were either intentionally or unintentionally excluded. You know, it, it was disproportionately comprised of uh, old guys. I mean, there was a significant number of women, and so the women's participation was kind of noteworthy. But, you know, more, it was, you know, 550-some or 60-some individuals of whom the, the youth were represented by 40. Uh, and the vast majority of those, were, of the people who were there, especially the male contingent, were you know, veterans of struggles that have been going on since the 1950s or 60s. Um, and they needed to be included because they have clout and in many cases also arms. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, um, again, it, it never did seem to be designed to fulfill the aspirations 
of the youthful right. uprising. Well then, so what happens now? I mean, does this create the foundation for Yemen to move forward, or are we back to square one? Probably neither of those. In other words, I don't think back to square one is quite accurate, but in terms of a roadmap for the future, uh, that has not revealed itself. Hmm. What could have been done differently? I mean, what might have uh, done a better job of resolving these, uh, these regional conflicts or incorporating diff di you know, diverse groups of society? Was this the best that was on offer, or could something have been done differently? You know, that's, of course, a um, very difficult question to answer. But the way the dialogue was constructed was a number of committees, two of which dealt with the Southern issue and the El Houthis, respectively, and then other ones dealt with things like transitional justice and socioeconomic development, and military and security. It's a very mixed bag. Mm -hmm. And it's conceivable that there ought to have been something closer to a, you know, kind of constitutional effort and then separate negotiations for the um, two regional conflicts. So I'm not saying I could have made a better design, but again, I think the, 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 the motives were very mixed and were not really... Yeah. Um, you know, designing a, a political system moving forward wasn't the sort of foremost objective. So now, I mean, from afar, you, you we hear these very disturbing reports of, of famine and, and water shortages and the collapse of governance in significant parts of the state. Do you think that's exaggerated? Or do you think that that's uh, something which we should really be paying attention to? No, I mean, I think those things are, you know, again, it, it, they don't affect all parts of the country equally or all socioeconomic groups equally, but the environmental catastrophe is real and affects many parts of the country. The collapse of um, what has never been a very strong system of law and order is also very real. And, you know, Al-Qaeda was not as much of a presence a, a few years ago, and there's certainly a theory that perhaps um, operations against Al-Qaeda have become a magnet for foreign fighters and Al-Qaeda wannabes and sympathizers and so forth, but they're increasingly brazen in um, attacking uh, officers or military installations, so that's also a worsening situation. Mm -hmm. um, things are, are pretty dire, actually, I think. You've written uh, various articles about the impact of drone strikes and, uh, and the way that that is feeding into some of these internal problems inside of Yemen. I mean, what's your position on this now in terms of what this approach to the Al-Qaeda problem has and hasn't accomplished? You know, I mean, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen are kind of jointly engaged in these um, counterterrorism operations that result in at least some, you know, bad targeting so that civilians are killed, but perhaps even more sociologically interesting, the presence of drones hovering overhead in communities. Right. And there's a backlash specific, there's a little bit of a backlash against the U.S., but I think the strongest backlash is against the Yemeni government. Why are you allowing? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, foreign militaries to be buzzing our village for weeks on end. And so it's contrary to the state building objectives, uh, you know, that the United States and the, the GCC countries declare themselves to have. So it's not just uh, the radicalizing effect that you're worried about, it's actually harming the sovereignty. It's harming the sovereignty and it's harming the perception of sovereignty and the I mean, there is the radicalizing effect, but I think more generally there's kind of alienation from even the Yemeni government. Do you think that the, uh, the, the number of uh, civilian deaths is significantly understated? You know, it's very hard to tell because the whole premise of these signature strikes is that anyone who gets killed must have been Al-Qaeda. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes difficult to say. But clearly a lot of people who did not need to be assassinated have been assassinated, and some of them have been serious mistakes. Is that an, and then in addition, there's the collateral damage, to use the term of art, 
multiple people killed when there was a single target. But you're talking about even beyond that. You're talking about the, um, the targeting itself. Well, the targeting itself. I mean, so there was the case not that long ago where, you know, two friendly guys gave a ride to two other guys, and those two guys were targeted. Right. But then there's this notion of signature strikes where if, you, if, you know, the drone picks up um, a car full of guys with rifles, then they become suspects. But, I mean, Yemen is full of guys with rifles riding, you know, uh, mm -hmm. on on rural roads. So that in and of itself cannot be taken as evidence. And even if that happens only sometimes, it creates a lot of suspicion and also a lot of fear. Do you think, is this a major issue inside of Yemen or is it something that we focus on here in Washington because it's about us? I think it has become an increasing issue inside of Yemen. Uh, in part because of the efforts of a couple of noteworthy young people like uh, Farah al-Muslimi and uh, Ruj and, and uh, Atif al-Wazir and others, you know, to publicize it. But everything I see suggests that more and more Yemenis are worried about this and concerned about it and angry about it. Let me ask one uh, somewhat different question. Uh, in, in, in the new book, uh, The Political Aid and Arab Activism, um, you, you take a very critical look at the, the actual effects of these democracy programs and civil society building. So if, if you shift from drone strikes to actually, suppose people wanted to help Yemen in the United States, whether multilateral institutions, NGOs, and they wanted to try and do these kinds of civil society building, capacity building that you describe in the book, what could usefully be done by the international community or by outside actors to try and help Yemenis accomplish what you think they want to accomplish? You know, this is actually an indirect answer to your question, but even the dialogue um, conference in a certain way was a donor project. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an initially Yemeni initiative, but it was very much taken over by donors, the federalism project advice when I was in Yemen last, almost a year ago now, um, I went to a number of sessions where there were various international experts in federalism had come in to give lectures on federalism. And then the next thing you know is that the dialogue committee has produced a federalism thing. That's an example of what I think is not particularly useful. Okay. Right now, I'm not sure that democracy promotion is what most Yemenis want. I mean, there are really serious social and economic problems, um, which isn't just a plea for kind of conventional assistance, but, uh, you know, then to come finally to the question of what could we do, I think it would be to really seriously rethink the strategy of thinking of Yemen as mainly um, a target mm -hmm. for military action and work instead on mm -hmm. um, social and economic concerns. So you think more, more focus on economic development and uh, trying to deal with the environmental and uh, social problems would probably go farther than working on uh, political institutions, political party building, and those sorts of projects? You know, party building, that sort of thing, I'm not so sure. I mean, there are some institutions that could be improved. Uh, you know, the justice system, if it were genuinely improved, legal education is another one. But, you know, the, the, the needs are so great in areas like medicine and education. I mean, they're really huge, dire, you know, urgent needs in those areas. Some of the other, and again, I think, in my opinion, money would be better spent on those things than on military operations. Um, and then the political concerns... It seems to me if it's not really well designed and thought through, then it's probably almost worse than nothing. All right, worse than nothing. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Sheila Carapiccio, University of Richmond. Thank you for joining us in the Poll Maps Conversations. Great to be here. Thanks.